In July 1959, Vice President Richard Nixon flew to Moscow in the role of traveling salesman for an ideology. The ideology of capitalism. To Russians accustomed to the primitive facilities of cramped communal housing, the contrast between the American exhibition of consumer durables and the surrounding implausibly ornate Soviet park of economic achievement was a revelation. 50,000 people came every day for a glimpse of this parallel universe. Among them was Nikita Khrushchev. Son, Khrushchev had emerged as first secretary of the Soviet Communist Party after Stalin's death in 1953. The highlight of the US exhibition was an all-mod cons kitchen, complete with dishwasher, electric cooker, and the jewel in the crown of the all-American domestic goddess, a giant refrigerator. Nixon relished pointing out to Khrushchev that when it came to living standards, the United States was miles ahead of the Soviet Union. There are some instances where you may be ahead of us. For example, in the development of, your, of the thrust of your rockets for the investigation of outer space. There may be some instances, for example, color television, where we're ahead of you. But in order for both of us, for both of us to benefit, for both of us to benefit, <laughs> you see, you never concede anything. <laughs> Khrushchev blustered, but he had no icebox. And the icebox was the American secret weapon in the Cold War, a symbol of just how far ahead the United States was in the economic race. About 30 years after Khrushchev harangued Nixon on the failings of capitalism, I came here to the Park of Economic Achievement in Moscow. It was just after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and I'm afraid to say that I came here to laugh. After all, what could be more absurd than a Soviet Park of Economic Achievement? Here, it seemed to me, was the perfect answer to the question, why did the West win the Cold War? It was the economy, stupid. That, however, was only half the story. The United States was always going to come first in an economic contest. Yet it would be to misunderstand the Cold War completely to dismiss it as simply a one-horse race. For the Soviet Union had other formidable weapons at its disposal. That was why, for more than 40 years, the outcome of the Cold War was anything but certain. It was also why, in many parts of the world, the Cold War wasn't cold at all. You may have missed it, but the Third World War really happened. Whether it's hot or cold, war is about firepower as well as economic resources. The Soviets had shown clearly enough in the 1940s that when it came to mass producing weaponry, they were the only people who could match the Americans. In one fundamental respect, it's true, the Russians were temporarily behind. In 1945, they had no atomic bomb. But the speed with which they closed what became known as the missile gap was astonishing. This was the most hectic and high-risk competition in history, the arms race. 
the War of the World made the 20th century the most violent in history, then the nuclear bomb provided its logical conclusion. A single weapon that could devastate a whole city. Wedded to missile technology acquired free of charge from the defeated Nazis, it didn't even require a pilot to reach its target. At first, Stalin had dismissed the bomb as a toy designed to frighten those with weak nerves. But that was before the United States tested the first hydrogen bomb. One H-bomb had an explosive yield 750 times that of the A-bomb dropped on Hiroshima. In retrospect, it can seem as if the danger of a thermonuclear apocalypse actually reduced the risk of a third world war. But at the time, a nuclear conflict was a very real possibility that came terrifyingly close to happening. Since the nuclear stalemate became apparent, the governments of East and West have adopted the policy called brinkmanship. This is a policy adapted from a sport which, I am told, is practiced by some youthful degenerates. This sport is played by choosing a long straight road and starting two very fast cars towards each other from opposite ends. As they approach each other, mutual destruction becomes more and more imminent. As the British philosopher Bertrand Russell realized, at one level, nuclear strategy was like a game. But the game Russell was reminded of was the simple and lethal game played by James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause. Chicken. If one of them swerves from the white line before the other, the other, as he passes, shouts, Chicken. This lethal competition could be illustrated by a new mathematical discipline, game theory. Suppose you're player A in the game of chicken. The optimal outcome is for you to show your machismo by driving straight and forcing the other player, player B, to swerve. You survive to gloat, and he's the chicken. The next to worst outcome is, of course, if you swerve and he drives straight. If the Soviets could be persuaded that Washington was really prepared to risk Armageddon, so the theory went, they would be more likely to swerve. But what if they didn't? The worst outcome is, of course, if both players drive straight. Then, bam, the police have to scrape them both off the dashboards of their hot rods. Unfortunately, the game theorist's conclusion was that in the nuclear game of chicken, the more reckless player was likely to win. To Bertrand Russell, it was all too easy to imagine the consequences. Sooner or later, the moment will come when neither side can face the derisive cry of chicken. When that moment has come, the statesmen of both sides will plunge the world into destruction. This would be the formula for Armageddon. When the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev went on holiday, it was to his dacha at Pitsunda, looking out across the Black Sea. He liked to give his visitors binoculars and ask them, what do you see? Once they were suitably mystified, he would say, I see US missiles in Turkey aimed at my dacha. The presence of medium-range American nuclear missiles in Turkey irked Khrushchev. The only way the Soviets could hit the US 
was with expensive and technically complex intercontinental missiles. Then at some point in April 1962, he had a brainwave. Following an abortive CIA-sponsored invasion of Cuba, Khrushchev proclaimed his intention to defend the island and its Marxist dictator, Fidel Castro. The Soviet leader's real aim was to use Cuba as a nuclear launching pad. At a stroke, he would bring American cities and missile bases within reach of medium-range Soviet missiles. According to the myth perpetuated by the acolytes of John F. Kennedy, what followed was a triumph for hardball diplomacy. In the famous phrase of Dean Rusk, Kennedy and Khrushchev were eyeball to eyeball, and the other guy blinked. In other words, Kennedy won the ultimate game of diplomatic chicken. The reality was very different. In fact, Kennedy and his advisers were thrown into confusion by the audacity of the Soviet move. After protracted agonizing, Kennedy decided to impose a naval blockade to halt further Soviet shipments to Cuba. And at the same time, to issue an ultimatum. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to halt and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace and to join in an historic effort to end the perilous arms race and to transform the history of man. It was a livid autumn sunset in Washington, D.C. on the evening of Saturday, October the 27th, 1962. The American Defense Secretary, Robert McNamara, remembered stepping outside the White House to savor it, to look and to smell it, he recalled, because I thought it was the last Saturday I would ever see. No other time in the Cold War did the world come as close to a nuclear conflagration as it did on that October day. With the alert status of both nuclear forces at the highest level short of war itself, the world was literally on the eve of destruction. If the nuclear game of chicken had ended in a head-on collision, the war of the world could have reached its lethal crescendo over Cuba in 1962. But in this game of chicken, the game theorists got it wrong. Both sides swerved. The man who talked to the Russians plainly, firmly, and meant every word he said is the hero of America and is fervently thanked by the great majority of the Western world. Khrushchev offered to pull out the Cuban missiles in return for the withdrawal of the American missiles in Turkey. Kennedy accepted, provided the deal could be kept secret. He wanted it to look as if only Khrushchev had backed down. It was over. This is a very dangerous and uncertain world. I'm confident, as I look uh, to the future, that our chances for security, our chances for peace, are better than they've been in the past. But chickens, of course, have a way of coming home to roost. So convincing was Kennedy's claim to have made Khrushchev chicken out over Cuba, that just over a year later, a crazed Castro sympathizer named Lee Harvey Oswald shot him dead. As for Khrushchev, he was fatally weakened in the eyes of his Politburo comrades, 
Two years after trading Cuban missiles for Turkish, Khrushchev himself was traded in for Leonid Brezhnev. The real winner of the Cuban Missile Crisis was therefore Castro. He would remain in power for decades as the arena of superpower rivalry moved elsewhere. The Cuban Missile Crisis revealed just how close to a Third World War the United States and the Soviet Union could come. But what it also revealed was that even if both sides swerved in the great game of nuclear chicken, it was still possible to wage war in other ways. It's a myth to think that the advent of mutually assured destruction somehow ushered in an era of world peace. The real and bloody Third World War would be waged by the likes of Castro in the Third World itself. In 1952, ten years before the Cuban Missile Crisis, the left-wing government in the tiny Central American Republic of Guatemala enacted Decree 900, a reform that took idle land away from some of the country's biggest estate owners and redistributed it to poor peasants. It was a fatal mistake. Among the landowners dismayed by this development was the American United Fruit Company, which faced the loss of a quarter of a million acres. United Fruit had friends in high places back in Washington, D.C. The future Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, was one of its lawyers. That very year, his brother Alan became Deputy Director of the CIA. But American politicians didn't need much convincing that Jacobo Arbenz's government was a Soviet Trojan horse in America's backyard. President Eisenhower already saw the left-wing government in Guatemala as a mere tool of Moscow. Now he gave the CIA the green light to back a motley band of anti-government rebels. In fact, the anti-communist invasion of Guatemala was something of a fiasco, but it gave the army the cue to overthrow the Arbenz government. The new military regime was given Washington's official blessing from none other than Vice President Richard Nixon. You know, there were some people during the Arbenz regime that said that there was a question as to whether it was truly a communist regime uh, and as to whether it was controlled by Moscow. Uh, we have here the proof that there was no question well, whatever. Was no that is, these are just samples. We've got mountains of this material, that I understand, that you found when you were here yeah. in Guatemala. Yeah. Which showed the direct control the by the control international by communist conspiracy. Salian, you see. Then the message to Moscow was loud and clear. Stay out of this hemisphere and don't try to start your plans and your conspiracies over here. We tend to remember the Cold War as a bipolar battle between two superpowers. We forget that in Guatemala and many other countries in the so-called Third World, the superpowers chose not to fight head on. Instead, they waged war, a war almost as bloody as the First World War. Army river patrols, working with Manea's own civil defense force, are seen in a typical advance against yet another. The degree of superpower sponsorship varied. You say you are fighting Cubans in Mozambique? Yes, Cubans, Zimbabweans, and Tanzanian soldiers. Sometimes their own troops fought in the front line, as in Korea and Vietnam. More often, they were behind the lines, training or supplying local armies. Sometimes, as in Africa and the Middle East, the support itself was subcontracted. In fact, the second half of the 20th century wasn't much less violent than the first half. In all, something like 20 million people were killed in a total of around 100 major military conflicts. 
it was just the location of the violence that had shifted. Instead of confronting one another head-on, as they so nearly did in Cuba in 1962, the superpowers now waged war through intermediaries in what they considered to be peripheral theatres. But there was nothing peripheral or cold about these wars to the people caught up in them. Here, as in so many other respects during the Cold War, from espionage to ice hockey, the United States found that it was at a fundamental disadvantage. This was the future of the world as the Soviets saw it. As the old empires over Western Europe disintegrated after 1945, popular nationalist movements all over the Third World eagerly embraced the Soviet model. Popular liberation meant hitting the jackpot for Moscow's Third World Lenins. It was a good time to be a dictator. It was also a very good time to be an armed salesman. And here the Soviets had a further advantage. They knew better than anyone how to arm illiterate peasants with cheap, reliable weapons. Back in the 1960s, there was a small arms race running parallel to the nuclear arms race. Weapons like this Kalashnikov were flooding the world, particularly its poorest countries. What was the United States to do? There seemed little option but to fight dirty, as dirty, in fact, as the Soviets. After all, guns like these can be used not only in civil wars, but also by dictators to quell domestic political opposition. Nowhere was this more obvious than in Latin America. But the US regarded it as its own geopolitical backyard. Like Jekyll and Hyde, American foreign policy in the Cold War came in two quite distinct guises. By day, preaching the highfalutin rhetoric of freedom, democracy, and the shining city on a hill. By night, using dirty tricks to stymie suspected Soviet clients and prop up local strongmen polite language for dictators. It was actually an American dictum that had originated in Central America between the wars. It doesn't matter if he's a son of a bitch, as long as he's our son of a bitch. In the Cold War, this became the essence of what some commentators rather euphemistically called realism. After the CIA-backed coup in Guatemala, the agency helped the new government compile a list of 72,000 suspected communist sympathizers. But like the Soviets with Castro, the Americans soon discovered that their Latin American puppets came with few strings attached. For a country like Guatemala was not a colony. Its government had a will of its own. By the mid-1960s, paramilitary death squads were roaming the Guatemalan streets and countryside, engaging in what the US State Department admitted were kidnappings, torture, and summary executions. The counterinsurgency was running wild. Between January the 2nd and January the 5th, 1966, around 30 left-wing leaders were taken here to the Guatemalan military headquarters at Fort Matamaros. They were tortured and then they were murdered. The bodies were put in sacks, flown out over the Pacific and thrown overboard. The CIA report on this exercise said that the Guatemalan government should not acknowledge the executions or even admit that the men had been taken into custody. That was the CIA's idea of a clean-up operation a dirty war that left no incriminating fingerprints. Operation Cleanup introduced what was to become the signature tactic of proxy Cold War violence in Latin America, 
the disappearance of opponents. Over the next 30 years, more than 40,000 people would disappear in Guatemala. It was the same story in Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, and Chile. Los desaparecidos became a euphemism for those murdered by the military. Yet who exactly was being disappeared? As far as the CIA was concerned, the answer was communist sympathizers, potential revolutionaries who might already have been recruited to the side of Moscow. And yet, in reality, the conflicts that bedeviled the Third World throughout the Cold War were as much about ethnicity as they were about ideology. Guatemalan society was hierarchically ordered according to ethnicity, with the relatively few pure-blood descendants of conquistadors and plantation owners at the top, and at the very bottom, the landless indigenous peoples, to whom policies like redistribution of land had the greatest appeal. The proxy war the CIA was underwriting in Guatemala was not so much a war between capitalists and communists as a war between landowners descended from Spaniards and impoverished Mayan peasants. Because so many of the 200,000 victims of the civil war were Mayan, Guatemala's military was deemed by the UN-sponsored Truth Commission to have added to the 20th century's long list of genocides. The bitter truth about the morality tale of the Cold War was that in the Southern Hemisphere, the United States did about as much for freedom as the Soviet Union did for liberation. So the long peace of the Cold War wasn't really on offer to anyone other than Soviet and American citizens and those in immediate proximity to them in the Northern Hemisphere. For the majority of the world's citizens, there was no such peace. There was only the reality of a Third World War, a war that involved almost as much ethnic conflict as the Second World War before it, a war that by the 1960s, the United States showed every sign of losing. The 37th President of the United States is Richard Nixon. See revealed something of the man whose vision guides the nation, whose actions affect the world. Not long after being elected President in November 1969, Richard Nixon named a surprising choice as his national security advisor. A Harvard historian who hadn't even been born in the United States. To Nixon, Henry Kissinger seemed the perfect foil. As gregarious as Nixon was shy and reclusive. Before long, American foreign policy was firmly in the hands of the international man of history. Kissinger's party animal antics were a tonic for a nation unnerved. For the Cold War was not going America's way. The much-vaunted U.S. capitalist system, which Nixon himself had so proudly showcased in Moscow ten years earlier, was faltering. Americans were no longer willing to tolerate the human or financial cost of winning the biggest proxy war of them all, Vietnam. Yet Nixon's goal of peace with honor remained elusive. It was time to change Cold War tactics. Together, Nixon and Kissinger planned to abandon the strategy of war by proxy in favor of great power diplomacy. During the spring and summer of 1969, US government officials had watched with interest as ideological and political disagreements between the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China escalated into fighting here on the border in Manchuria. <laughs> 
There was fevered speculation that the Soviets might launch attacks on Chinese nuclear weapons facilities. But to Henry Kissinger, this wasn't a crisis. It was an opportunity. Others in America and in Russia might see the Cold War as a crude game of chicken. To Kissinger, it was more like classical diplomatic chess. Like his hero Bismarck, who'd enhanced Germany's position by playing the other European states off against one another, Kissinger sought to strengthen America's position by exploiting the Sino-Soviet antagonism. The problem was that Kissinger's plan meant doing business with China. And no American official had set foot in Beijing since 1949. Nor did this seem a terribly opportune moment to re-establish diplomatic ties. In the late 1960s, China was in the grip of a second wave of Maoist radicalism, the Cultural Revolution. Officially, this was an attempt by Chairman Mao to resist bureaucratic tendencies and revive revolutionary fervor. But in reality, the Cultural Revolution was at once a lethal power struggle at the top of the Communist Party and a ghastly war between generations. Mao urged university students to identify and hound suspect teachers who were forced publicly to confess their problems. Many were tortured. Some were driven to suicide. At least 23 faculty members here at Beijing University were persecuted to death in this way. All this was done in the name of, and at the instigation, of a godlike Mao. It's extraordinary to think what was done to professors like me in lecture rooms like this one in late 1960s China. It made the riots on American university campuses look like teddy bears picnics. As William Buckley, a Republican journalist close to Kissinger said, Rapprochement with Beijing meant doing business with murderers who put the Latin American dictators in the shade. And yet all of this was secondary to Kissinger. In the great diplomatic game of chess, he was about to check the Red King. In February 1972, Nixon flew to China, and these are the notes he made on the way by way of preparation. They make fascinating reading. What they want, number one, build up their world credentials. Number two, Taiwan. Number three, get US out of Asia. And then you read on, and you get to what we both want, restraint on USSR. It wasn't that Nixon expected the Chinese somehow to bail him out of Indochina. It was more that an opening to Beijing was designed to put pressure on the Soviets, in particular, to make them more open to the idea of an agreement on strategic arms limitation. So when Nixon arrived in China, it wasn't to boast about the superiority of the American way of life, as he'd done in Moscow in 1959. On the contrary, he was perfectly ready to conceal his deep-seated distaste for communism for the sake of thawing the Cold War. This was the moment Nixon believed that would secure his place in history. And he wasn't about to let anyone share the limelight. To Kissinger's intense irritation, no one apart from Nixon's wife was allowed off the plane until after the first presidential handshake. The visit was a triumph. Nixon was even taken to meet Mao himself. In fact, the ailing despot insisted on it. Two 
According to the testimony of his doctor, Mao was beside himself with excitement on the day of Nixon's arrival. The president of the free world, a socially inept man at the best of times, was intensely nervous about this tete-a-tete -tete with the Red Emperor. So much so that he made notes to remind himself how to behave. Treat him as emperor. Don't quarrel. Don't praise him too much. Praise the people, art, ancient. Praise poems, love of country. You don't know me, Nixon opened, inadvertently sounding once again like a salesman. But anything I say, I deliver. The handshake with Mao, the photo opportunity on the Great Wall, the sound of a Chinese military band playing America the Beautiful at a banquet. Even in his wildest imaginings, Nixon could not have wished for more. The Soviets were forced to the negotiating table, just as Kissinger had hoped. Within three months, Nixon and Brezhnev had signed two arms control pacts. This was the week that changed the world, Nixon proclaimed. His reward was triumphant re-election. But were Nixon and Kissinger, in some sense, the pawns on someone else's board? Near the end of the trip, the Americans were invited to attend a special Maoist ballet. It was a parable about an honest communist defeating a corrupt capitalist. It was a pointed reminder to the Americans that while they might have played the China card, the Chinese also had an American card to play. exactly was it the Chinese were after? Kissinger and Nixon had guessed that Mao wanted three things. To boost China's international standing, to move closer to annexing Taiwan, and to get the United States out of Asia. They didn't know the half of it. The farewell banquet was awash with Chinese liquor and American goodwill. Sure, Taiwan would now be marginalized and its United Nations seat handed over to the government in Beijing. Sure, the United States would soon be out of Vietnam, maybe even out of South Korea. And yet that wasn't all that the Chinese saw as being up for grabs. So fixated were the Americans on good relations with Mao that China's neighbors could now be bullied with impunity. Tibet, which had been annexed by China in 1951, could now be forcibly settled with ethnic Han Chinese. And it wasn't just the Americans who were going to get kicked out of Indochina. It was Mao's old sponsors and new enemies, the Russians. In the end, it turned out that nothing, not even the Grand Master of Diplomacy, Henry Kissinger, could salvage American honor from the wreckage of Vietnam or save Richard Nixon from himself. Forced to resign by the political scandal of Watergate, Nixon nevertheless clung to the idea that his opening to China had secured his place in history. We must now ensure that the one quarter of the world's people who live in the People's Republic of China will be and remain not our enemies, but our friends. But was Nixon right that his foreign policy at least had been a success? In reality, detente with the Soviets had been bought at the price of unleashing a second communist superpower. China's potential to challenge the United States economically was still only a twinkle in the eye of Mao's successor, but China's strategic ambition was already apparent in the most brutal of all the Third World's proxy wars.
Indochina in the 1970s was the perfect illustration of how superpower interventions in local conflicts could cause them to spiral out of control. The United States had fought to save South Vietnam and lost. The Soviets had backed North Vietnam and won. But the Chinese, determined to topple the Soviet Union from its leadership of the communist world, wanted to punish the North Vietnamese for seeking assistance from Moscow instead of Beijing. These scores would be settled with almost unimaginable violence in neighboring Cambodia. Used by the North Vietnamese as a sanctuary and supply route for Viet Cong guerrillas, Cambodia had been the target of a supposedly secret American bombing campaign. But the resulting civilian casualties merely provided the perfect recruiting opportunity for Cambodia's Chinese-backed communists, the Khmer Rouge. This extraordinary bas relief depicts the Battle of Kurukshetra, an episode from the ancient Hindu epic, the Mahabharata. It's a timeless image of the struggle between the sons of light, the Padavas, and the sons of darkness, the Kauravas. To me, it's a kind of metaphor for 20th century conflict, except that in the epic, it's the sons of light who ultimately prevail. And that certainly wasn't what happened in Cambodia in the 1970s. The leader of the Khmer Rouge was Saloth Sar, a failed electronics student who'd become a communist while studying in Paris. His nom de guerre was Pol Pot. Struck by his leader's utterly cold demeanor and his total ruthlessness towards his enemies, one of his comrades once compared Pol Pot with a Buddhist monk who had attained the third level of consciousness. You are completely neutral. Nothing moves you. This is the highest level. Just what Pol Pot was capable of doing in this transcendental state became clear immediately. When the capital Phnom Penh fell to the Khmer Rouge on April the 17th, 1975, the stony-faced victors ordered the evacuation of the city. Then, the killings began. This is Chung Ek, just south of Phnom Penh, used by the Khmer Rouge as a site for mass executions. Something like 9,000 bodies have been recovered from the mass graves all around me, though the true number killed here was probably double that. To save on bullets, the Khmer Rouge used axes, they used knives, they even used bamboo sticks to kill their victims. Many of the skulls dug up here have gaping holes in them. As for children, they were simply dashed against this Chankiri tree. The terrible fate of Cambodia illustrates how very far from cold the Cold War was in those parts of the world where the superpowers waged their war by proxy. But it also shows how little economics really had to do with the boundless violence of the Third World's War. For Pol Pot's regime repudiated the very idea of economic progress. Year zero was proclaimed. The towns were to be emptied. All markets were to be abolished. There would be no more money. Everyone would be dressed in black. The aim was to produce Kampuchea, a pure communist agrarian state. As these pictures of slave laborers filmed by the Khmer Rouge indicate, they didn't much care how many people died in the process. As they told the bewildered city dwellers, 
To preserve you is no gain. To destroy you is no loss. But as in Guatemala, there was another familiar element to the killings. For the Khmer Rouge, this was more than just a class war. It was also an ethnic war. Hostility to the Vietnamese minority had already manifested itself even before Pol Pot came to power, but now it simply ran amok. Around 100,000 ethnic Vietnamese were executed, as many as 225,000 ethnic Chinese and 90,000 members of the Cham minority are also thought to have died. In all, between one and a half and two million Cambodians were eliminated out of a total population of only seven million. But what ultimately destroyed this maniacal regime was the war it launched against neighboring Vietnam in 1977. Here was a bizarre fulfillment of the American strategy of exploiting discord within the communist bloc. Two communist states at war with one another. One, Vietnam, backed by the Soviet Union. The other, Pol Pot's Cambodia, backed by none other than China. And yet the American-Chinese rapprochement engineered by Richard Nixon led Cold War realpolitik into the realm of the absurd. After Vietnam invaded Cambodia, the United States found itself backing the Khmer Rouge as it withdrew into the hills to fight a brutal guerrilla war. While Americans, Europeans and Russians reaped the benefits of the Cold War's unintended nuclear peace, the lethal fallout from superpower rivalry continued to rain down on Asia. There could only be one winner in the US-Soviet competition. But in the Third World's War, the losers could be counted in millions. The 1980s would determine which of the two superpowers would finally be proclaimed the winner of the Cold War. But the rise of a new superpower in the East meant that the War of the World was far from over.